So, yeah, it's recording now. So I'll just go to my presentation. Oh, sorry, I'll just share my screen and then do that. Okay. So, Cameron, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see it, yeah. Okay, perfect. So we'll just begin and then uh, see how it goes. So um, thank you all for joining again. And uh, these are my details for the first years. And on the right side, you can see the, the website of CAPSOC, which is Cancer and Pathology Society and uh, the Instagram and the email of CAPSOC. So please do email us or visit our website if you need anything. So just, uh, just uh, uh, to begin with, I want to discuss what is pathology. So it's basically the study of mechanisms of disease, but also all of these things that I've listed here. So we have anatomical pathology, which mostly deals with um, tissues and uh, looks uh, at tissues under microscopy. Um, so histology, uh, histopathology is under that. Cytopathology is the study of uh, fluids mostly um, under microscopy. Forensic pathology that I think uh, ha it has in its name uh, the, the purpose of it and molecular pathology is, is, a, is a newly emerging area where you look at uh, genes and how genes are turned on and off uh, in, in certain diseases. And microbiology is also a part of pathology. I didn't know that, uh, but it is a part of pathology. So if you want to learn more about pathology, we have a great, great uh, talk by Dr. Carmo, who kindly gave us a talk on uh, a, what uh, do pathologists do and uh, and uh, some examples of uh, pathological diseases. It's mostly dermatopathology. Okay, so just uh, an overview of on CAPSOC, so Cancer and Pathology Society. Um, we provide clinical events, and I'm gonna briefly show you what they were in 2020. Uh, we do also have audit and research opportunities recently uh, began uh, the process of uh, collecting data uh, for uh, a cancer audit in primary care, um, but it was delayed because of COVID-19. We hopefully are going to start the data collection soon, and uh, we have students involved in that. It's, it's very exciting, but we are also planning to host workshops for students to, to help them learn how to create posters and present them at national and international conferences, uh, which is always good on your CV. It's not that difficult to do, so uh, it, it should be easy with our help as well. Uh, revision material, obviously, we do obviously have revision material uh, on our website, and we have general revision uh, and also revision that is specifically um, uh, targeted to pathology and cancer in our curriculum. So uh, these are the things that we've done in 2020. Uh, just the, just the list of them. Uh, okay, so uh, we have a lot of um, virtual lab visits. Uh, so this one in particular was on uh, PCR and RT-PCR, how um, COVID-19 is diagnosed by swabs. We had, as I said, uh, a lecture by Dr. Carmo on what pathology, what is pathology. We had uh, a clinic, a talk on um, on the journey of patients and uh, journey of cancer patients. Really, uh, we also have a lot of um, uh, revision material on our website, a lot of mind maps. Um, uh, this one in particular, I think it's uh, it's on uh, metabolism. We had uh, recently a Movember fundraiser quiz night, which was very fun, and uh, a, a, a representative from Movember actually came and talked to us about mental health. We managed to raise about I think two hundred pounds uh, to give to Movember charity. Um, so I just wanted to mention that it's free to join CAPSOC. Uh, 
uh, just email us, please, and we will add you to our WhatsApp group. Our members have priority uh, for our events and research and audit opportunities. Um, the SU by regulation wants us to charge, uh, I think, three pounds. It is the minimum. But if you, if you contact us directly, we wouldn't charge anything. So be, be sure to just contact us directly, not through a DSU. So uh, going to histology then, uh, I'll uh, just briefly go and give you some background on uh, cell types and their origins. And then we will go through a my mind map of epithelia, which is really useful even in, uh, I think, uh, third year that we are, we just finished second year, but basically third year, I can say that now, I think. <laughs> And uh, we'll go we'll go over that. So it's it's uh, the website is this www.capsoc.co.uk. Okay, it's also on our Instagram page. If you just go there and but uh, Cameron, could you please just write the name of the website on the chat, please? Thank you. Thank you, Yash. Okay, so histology. Uh, as I said, it's very useful to know epithelia. And we'll do epithelia firstly because I think it was in, it's very important. Uh, one of the most important things really to know about histology. That I think it's the most challenging thing really uh, to get your head around um, epithelia. And also because the first years have just done epithelia, I thought it would be best to do that. So just the very brief overview of uh, tissue types. So this, uh, if you could imagine just um, an embryo, um, so um, uh, just uh, I think in the week, th in the third week of uh, pregnancy, uh, this is what the baby looks like. Um, you have three layers, uh, which is so an outside layer, which is called an ectoderm. You could see that uh, they're highlighted in blue and um, a middle layer, which is called a mesoderm, so middle mesoderm, and an endoderm, which is the internal layer. You will learn this in uh, eight week of histology, so don't worry, I think eight, seven or week, uh, sorry, week seven or eight of histology. Uh, but basically, all the tissue types arise from these three layers. Uh, we do have other uh, tissues that arise, I mean, the really um, uh, extra embryonic tissue, such as the placenta and the, uh, the amnion, which covers the, the baby. But uh, the main things that are in the baby's body, really on, on the body or in the body, are arising from these three layers. So the ectoderm, which is the outside, uh, if you could just imagine the, the skin is on the outside, you have most of your nerves um, on the outside pigment cells such as melanocytes. Uh, I'll, I'll, rec I'll record this, uh, the, uh, I'll just upload the recording onto our website and on YouTube. So I'll, I'll give you the link, uh, but um, I don't think on streams. So uh, moving on then, so pigment cells, skin cells and so on. Uh, the middle layer then, we have mesoderm, cardiac muscles, uh, skeletal muscle, uh, kidney tubules and so on. Uh, and also the bone, bones of your body. The endoderm, really the insides of your body, pancreatic cells, thyroid cells, lung cells, and so on, the di digestive tract. We'll come on to that uh, shortly also. So, and tissue types are really divided into four types of tissue. You have neural cells on the right-hand side, you have epithelia, which we just talked about. Epithelium basically means, um, the, uh, the the covering of of a uh, the, the the outside covering of of an organ or a tissue, which then immediately faces the lumen, uh, which is the outside, just the space outside. So that's the epithelium, connective tissue, and muscles. These are the four basic tissue types. So coming on to epithelia, as we said, we're going to focus on epithelia more than anything else uh, in this talk. So starting from the left-hand side, you have simple squamous epithelium, which is uh, very thin and it is uh, good for um, 
exchanging gases or anything that you want to uh, really exchange things fast and efficiently. So, and it's simple, so it means that it doesn't have, uh, it's not stratified, it's not layered. Coming on to the next one, simple cuboidal epithelium. These are found in the glands of your body or sometimes um, in your uh, bronchi bronchioles and also uh, the, the kidneys. Uh, then, uh, so these are also, sorry, these are also um, good for secretions, to secrete things and also absorption. Um, then the next thing is simple columnar epithelium. You can see here um, uh, a simple columnar epithelium with villi on top. Uh, you can find this in the intestine. These are good for absorption. And the villi specifically really increase the surface area for absorption. And they have, they, I think most of them, I'm not sure, but most of them also have uh, microvilli uh, that uh, increase that surface area even further. So uh, coming on to the middle now, stratified squamous epithelium. So uh, th this is just an advice. It's not, it's not a factual thing, but um, I, I tend to think of uh, squamous cells as sort of your cheaper, useless cells that you, you just ha you can make without, uh, without them costing a lot of money or energy or whatever. So you tend to pile up a lot of squamous, cheap, um, cost-efficient cells on top of each other for your protection. They're not very specialized. So you tend to put them for your protection. You have put, put a lot of them for your protection without much cost. So for protection, uh, you tend to have these uh, stratified squamous epithelium. Then stratified uh, epithelia are divided into uh, your uh, uh, creatinized stratified squamous epithelium or non-creatinized based on where it is. Um, stratified cuboidal epithelium at the bottom, middle bottom part, um, I think you can, it's very rare as far as I know. It's found um, mostly in the kidneys, I think, a bit in the urinary tract and the reproductive tract and also the uh, salivary glands, as far as I can remember. Next, we have pseudostratified columnar epithelium. These are uh, found in your, uh, uh, found in the reproductive tract, but most importantly, found in the um, upper respiratory tract. So these are not uh, villi like that of the simple columnar. These are actually uh, cilia, which are able to move. So they're not, for, um, they're not for increasing the surface area, but for movement. And these form something called the mucociliary escalator, which is good for um, uh, ex uh, expelling pathogens and different things such as dust and, and other things that get into your lung and you don't want them there. So you just use the cilia as, as an escalator to move things up that are trapped in mucus. So that's hence the name mucociliary escalator. Then we have stratified columnar epithelium. Uh, these are, I think, mostly found in the male uh, reproductive tract. Um, Cameron, are you able to see my screen? Uh, I can see it, yeah. Um, okay. The only thing I would say yeah. is, if you want to stay and keep listening, then please do so. But the Amir, did you say we'll upload the video to the website, yeah? Yes, yes. I'll upload the video and give the link to our uh, common group chat. Okay. And onto the Capsox uh, web, uh, sorry, WhatsApp group. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So moving on, uh, I think, I think Ahmed was it. Yeah, Ahmed. I think it's a problem with your um, device. Maybe like restart it. But um, yeah, we'll upload the video. Okay. So stratified columnar, uh, mostly in the rep male reproductive tract, as far as I know. But again, not very common. Okay, so just studying tips before we move on to actually going through the uh, the, the example of my uh, uh, mind map. I would say read over the sections of Jankira basic histology before your lectures. Just you know, read over it. You don't need to memorize everything. Just to ha just for you to have um, like a basic knowledge of things. It really did help me 
going over the, uh, the book before the lectures. Do the workbook questions and engage with group work. It's very important for you to engage in group work. I assume that you still have those case studies and um, vignettes that you go through each slide, like the, I don't know, the skin and other things. And explore different cell types with your iPad. Very important. Just, you know, go through different um, tissue samples uh, on your iPad. Do the Moodle quizzes for TOB, even in term four and five. Um, you would find them very useful, the, the, the Moodle quizzes. So please do them, and especially the first couple of quizzes. They're very useful. They do help you with uh, testing your own knowledge and also uh, gauging what the lecturer wants. Uh, use Capsox mind maps. <laughs> Uh, but we do have uh, great mind maps uh, on uploaded onto our website. Uh, they're not, maybe they're, I don't approve, I don't really, uh, I can't really guarantee the, the correctness of the, the, the thing because I made them. I'm not sure if uh, I, I didn't make a mistake in them, but, but they are very useful. I, I, I use them for my own revision. Uh, and I would say you could save time from making your own mind maps by using these and teach each other. Finally, teach each other. And um, I think it's a great way to learn. So finally, with the example, uh, sorry, with the example that we are going to look at, it's uh, an example of a mind map I made on Epithelia. So it's a huge mind map, but it's it has everything in the lecture that we were given in mid 19. So let's begin with the center of so types types of epithelia. Um, let's just go over some of the uh, the facts uh, or the smaller bits before we move on to the actual tissues. So uh, three embryonic origins that uh, that we talked about: ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. You got the epidermis, uh, the cornea of the eye, and the nerves and things in the ectoderm, which is the outside layer. Mesoderm is in the middle, uh, so you get the uh, urogenital tract and all the other things, such as the peritoneum and the heart, pleura, um, and, and so on. The endoderm is um, respiratory tract, GI tract, liver, and, and so on. So these are the three uh, um, things. Turnover rate. So turnover rate is dependent on the functional location of, of where the tissue is. Um, for instance, the small intestine, I think, has the, the greatest uh, turnover rate, which is four to six days. It's because a lot of things pass through the small intestine, so it has a high turnover rate. The, the epidermis also has a relatively high turnover rate, uh, 28 days of um, of, of, of 28 days, basically, uh, but um, this is in normal skin. I think with psoriasis and other types of uh, things that could cause inflammation and injury, then you get uh, accelerated um, turnover. So um, inflammation would cause these signals to be released that would uh, signal to the basal cells at the bottom of the epidermis to, to turn over. Uh, but remember that turnover um, does not equal um, the does not equal uh, uh, you know more likely to, the high, higher turnover wouldn't necessarily mean higher chances of you get, getting cancer from that specific tissue. Uh, like the bone marrow has a lot of turnover, but it doesn't necessarily have um, a lot of cancers in it. So, a new plasms of epithelia are called carcinomas, um, and on the other hand, new plasms of um, mesenchymal cells or mesodermal cells are called. Uh, 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 sorry, I forgot for a sec. Um, they're called uh, sarcomas. Yes, sorry. Uh, they're called sarcomas. So, carcinomas for epithelial cells and sarcomas for um, uh, for uh, mesenchymal cells. So this is a this is um, a way to help you with the classifications. Uh, one of my colleagues made this, and I really like this um, uh, 
the, this format. You can use it to remember it, but I just used sort of just remembered it. And um, yeah, so this is for your reference. You can use this. Um, so numbers of cells can be stratified or simple, then types of cells and shape of cells. OK, so we'll. Um, you can read about glands on your own time. It's uh, not very complicated. But uh, basically, I would like to just focus on one fact here. Intercalated dots. Um, intercalated dots um, are there, you can have two. Don't really worry. You don't need to worry about this. But if you're confused about intercalated dots, then this might help you. So intercalated dots are dots that come in a bit into the actual uh, the actual acinus, the actual part that secretes. So there are two places that I know of, and, uh, and this thus far that I made this uh, uh, made this mind map, I knew of these two places only. So pancreas and salivary glands only have intercalated ducts, uh, which sometimes make make them difficult to distinguish from each other. But I'm here. Striate, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, someone's got their hand up, uh, Bernita, yeah, yeah. if that's how you pronounce it please, correctly. Please go on. If you'd like to turn on your mic and speak, or you can type it in the chat. Um, do I have my hands up? Yeah, sorry. yeah. That could be a legacy hand, I'm very, very sorry. Oh, okay, no problem. No problem at all. Sorry, I'm here. Okay, I'm so, here. no, no, thank you, Cameron. So moving on, so... Um, Salivary glands are actually intercalated ducts that are striated, and that means striations are just um, features on on cells that um, are uh, that increase the absorption uh, function of of cells. So salivary glands would absorb uh, uh, different uh, at different uh, circumstances on different circumstances they would absorb different things. So these are necessary for them to have. And you can read about the, uh, the the classifications. You don't need to really know them, but these are just you know for your reference here. Then the, the thing that really matters is is this part. But I'm going to go over the the basement membrane, which I find uh, really good to understand because um, they like to bring this up a lot. Um, so it's it's good to know. So the basement membrane basically is what connects the epithelium, so the, the very bottom uh, cells are in the epithelium, if, if it's a, a, say, a straight, uh, sorry, um, a sort of a, a multi-layered cells, so, uh, cell um, epithelium, it, it connects it to the connective tissue below. So the basement membrane, as you can see here, is divided into two things called the, uh, the first one is called the basal lamina, which is at the top, and the reticular lamina, which is at the bottom. We will cover this more in detail in uh, later sessions of your TOB, but this I think I thought it would be good to know. So basal membrane, basal lamina, reticular lamina, and these are the parts. So uh, the structure is that the reticular lamina, which is the top bit, has a type three collagen, which is um, a type of connective tissue. We'll cover this later on, the types of connective tissue, but it's it's important to know that the reticular lamina and inside the basement membrane, you have type three collagen. And the, the basal lamina, sorry, the reticular, yeah, so the basal lamina uh, has a type four collagen and type seven collagen. This becomes important later on when you cover uh, the, the, the epidermis and the dermis. So what's the function of the, the basin membrane? Very important function. First of all, it, as we said, it anchors the cells of the epithelium above to the uh, connective tissue below. So it really anchors those two together. It also acts as a barrier for, um, uh, for malignant cells from, from invading. So for carcinomas, which are uh, malignant cells, as we said, that, that, that arise from uh, the epithelial cells, they, when they invade the basement membrane, they ha they have they 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 can metastasize, so they can go to the other parts of the the body and uh, invade. So that was on uh, the basement membrane. Now, basically, what we're going to do is briefly go over types of epithelium, 
and, and this mind map that I've made, and I've got simple and all the other types um, with all the pictures uh, in the uh, yes, integrism and, and coherence are also important. Thank you, Mariam. Uh, Yes, they do always come up in the exam. Uh, that you will cover those in your, uh, I think, MOD. But basically, um, e-cadherins or cadherins uh, connect cell to cells, so cells to cells, neighboring cells to each other, and also um, integrins connect the cells to the to the to the stroma or to the actual, uh, either it's the base of the membrane or the other other parts. I will send this mind map, mind map to you, absolutely. I've put a link uh, into the presentation, so if I send you the presentation, you have the mind map also. I've got other great, great mind maps too, so you just need to become a member of CAPSA. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's just begin with simple uh, squamous epithelia. So th these are, or just sorry, sim yeah, simple squamous. So simple squamous, you have the locations here, which I've uh, mentioned previously, the functions. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll provide that, uh, the, the links and things. Um, so the functions are uh, lubrication, gas exchange, barrier, uh, active transport. So I'm not going to go over all the, the locations, but we're going to go over these photos, which I've gotten directly from our curriculum. So you can see the kidney here. Uh, this is uh, a stain called the period periodic acid shift, which um, specifically nicely stains the, the basement membrane and anything that contains uh, glycoproteins. So you can see the distal tubule here uh, at the very top. You can see the proximal tubule there. Uh, you can see the glomerulus. Bowman's capsule and Bowman's space. So Bowman's capsule and the glomerulus, uh, they're lined by uh, simple squamous epithelia. You can see B, uh, number B here, uh, which is the Bowman's capsule, is covered by uh, simple squamous epithelium. And that is because you want a fast and efficient exchange of material, whatever. So you need to filter out things uh, efficiently in the kidney. This is another picture of the kidney. I don't think there are any uh, simple squamous epithelia here, but I just put it there because it's the kidney. OK, so the next one is simple cuboidal. If you have any questions, by the way, please do ask them. I'm more than happy to, to answer them. So simple cuboidal. I've mentioned that simple cuboidal are important for um, secretions, uh, sometimes absorptions as well. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, Mariam. And uh, periodic acid shift uh, is, is important. Uh, it comes up a lot. So uh, functions, uh, as I said, exocrine glands, absorption. It's also a barrier or a covering. And you do also use them as um, uh, things to, to synthesize your hormones inside and store it, store and mobilize them. Um, so H and E stain is is your basic stain. Uh, it's called hemotoxylin and eosin, uh, I believe, and uh, it just it just uh, stains. Uh, I think it's nucleic acid. No, I'm not sure actually. It's acidic things and basic things, I believe. Um, but there is a quiz on, I think, in session one of TOB. Uh, you could do that and you will learn all about the, the different stains. But basically, HE is your basic stain. You ba you, this is HE. Uh, this is HE, the thyroid, and the parathyroid. It, the, these, are, um, these two glands are, in this picture, are stained in, in HE. But uh, for more advanced or different thing, different um, reasons, you would you would stain things with different things, such as uh, PAS periodic acid shift. Okay, so uh, you can see here the uh, 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 low magnification of the thyroid. Next picture, a higher magnification. Uh, these cells. Uh, you can see here cuboidal thyrocytes. So these are the cells that make your thyroid hormone. They important sort of bring in and store 
different things to make thyroid hormone. I think you've covered this in your lecture, I'm not sure. But basically with iodine. iodine. Uh, they they do uh, they do they did for us I think for the for one of our exams they do like to ask about uh, massin trichrome and things so it's good to know and you can see here the cuboidal cells again I believe this is I'm not sure where I think this is uh, in the um, salivary glands I think but yes. And as we mentioned, ovaries also have uh, simple cubicle cells. Next one is simple columnar, um, mainly in the GI uh, system and also the, uh, the, the female reproductive system and indeed the male reproductive system also. This is a very important picture to know about. Uh, I think you'll, you'll cover this in your third session of TOB. I think someone asked the question. Mm -hmm. So shapes of different structures are just, uh, do you mean, the, do you mean the, the cell types or just generally? Sorry. Uh, sorry, if I may speak. Yes, please, please do. Uh, so what I mean is, uh, we do have a lot of uh, different shapes and different structures and different tissues, and we need yes. to uh, identify every single one of them. No, uh, no, especially I mean, in the uh, sometimes. Yeah. So what they Sorry, do is mostly. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry yeah. Go ahead. I, I'm just hearing an echo, like a really bad echo. That's why. Yeah, so basically uh, what they do in exams, they would give you um, a, a, a slide of, say, the, the thyroid, and then they would say that this is the thyroid, this is a, the slide of a thyroid. And you would then maybe need to um, either state the function of those cuboidal thyrocytes or say that they're actually cuboidal. And I think if you do the quizzes and by the time you, you get to week 12, you would be able to do that. So if you just revise and do the quizzes online, that's, you know, it's, it's I, th I think if you see enough of these pictures, you would realize that these are actually cuboidal. So it's not that difficult to, to guess because of, simply because of their height. So if you compare these two, the, this slide and this slide, and this, you would be immediately, uh, you know, struck with the fact that these are taller than, than, than the other ones. So um, the jejunum then, uh, very important, uh, do cover this uh, piece for your own revision. But basically the, the jejunum is, the epithelium is um, simple columnar. You can see simple columnar cells here covering uh, the uh, intestine jejunum with goblet cells which produce mucus. Uh, nicely. Thank you very much, Mariam. Yes, uh, 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 pancreas um, and the kidney and the thyroid. So uh, striated, I've listed here, striated here. I think this is also from uh, one of the uh, salivary glands. You can see the different types of uh, columnar cells. I've just given a bit more detail on uh, microvilli and the, the gap junctions, but this is just in the lecture. Um, I don't think this is very, so you don't need to focus on this too much, this slide or whatever, but I've just put it here for the sake of it. So a uh, simple pseudostratified epithelium. It's really, it's really simple, but it's pseudostratified. So where you would find that is uh, in the uh, upper respiratory tract and also I think the reproductive system. Um, so a feature that is prominent, two features that are prominent here and you need to know about is that the fact that they have cilia and we mentioned that cilia are functioning as a part of a system which is the mucociliary escalator and uh, the fact that the cells 
um, sh show a pseudo stratified uh, appearance in that um, the cells are actually simple, uh, meaning that they have uh, they don't have layers, but they appear as having layers because of the difference in the heights of the nuclei. So if you see here, and if you follow cells to the to the lumen to the top, you would find that they would actually reach the lumen and all of them would touch the basement membrane, which you can see here. So they're not really uh, stratified, they're pseudo stratified. Uh, this is also a very popular um, uh, slide, so please do study it. This is the trachea. You can see the hyaline cartilage, which you will cover in uh, uh, PB session six. Um, so uh, we come on to uh, stratified or compound epithelia. Uh, this is stratified squamous, non-cratinized locations of listed here, oral cavity, vagina. Uh, basically the places that you would need protection, but you would not uh, need to save water. So like the skin, you would, you would not want to lose water, hence uh, the fact that you have uh, the, uh, the cr cratinized layer. But in the vagina, esophagus, you would need to, you, would, you don't want to uh, not lose water, basically. Uh, okay, moving on. So you can see here that these uh, stratified squamous cells are actually stratified. There, there's a lot of them and you need them for protection. Uh, and these darker staining cells here, these are the basal cells, which are very active. The nuclei are very active, hence the fact that they, they actually stain darker, so they're more active than your regular top cells. So you can see it here also. Here, the epiglottis uh, and the cornea, which is thin, as you can see. I think it's the only place, if I'm not mistaken, where you can actually have the... Uh, on the outside, you have stratified squamous, non-cratinized, um, and it is on the outside. So, uh, stratified squamous, cratinized, a very, very important uh, thing for you to, uh, to remember is um, the, the skin. Just answer me some of the questions. So, in exams, does there tend to be many writing answers or more motivations? More, more so, um, uh, short answers and fill in the fill in the blanks and things. Uh, any vignette? Would they give you a slide and ask you about your questions? Um, so they tend not to do that. Um, tomorrow. I, um, so you would be mostly asked about the functions and the types of epithelia. Uh, I've not really seen anything on uh, the different microscopy techniques. So, as I said, this is a very important slide to know about. Uh, you can see the, the stratified squamous cratinized because you need protection and you need to save water from evaporating. That's why you have the cratinization. And cratin, uh, which is this layer at the top, so stratum corneum, you see at the very top right-hand corner, that's basically referring to the cratinized layer, which is that these are dead cells, dead cells that eventually have come from the bottom cells, uh, and you don't see, you don't tend to see uh, nucleated cells. These are just dead cells. And if we see many nucleated cells, that's a sign of um, improper cratinization. Um, uh, So, uh, as I said, they, they tend to give um, pictures and ask you what the what the uh, you, you can you should identify the, um, the epithelium. That's basically it. And they also ask about function and why a specific thing is there. Um, yeah, that's mostly it in terms of what they ask in the letter. Um, do use, I think that the, 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 if you use the quizzes, those are very useful. I think they're not the same, but similar to what you, you should expect for the exam. 
So uh, transitional epithelia is the next one. Uh, you can only find them in the uh, uh, urinary tract. So workbook also, the workbook questions are also very good and the quizzes on Moodle, so online quizzes. We have online quizzes for our um, uh, TOB uh, module, so I'm assuming that you do as well. So stratified uh, transitional or just transitional epithelium only in the renal tracts. Uh, you can see these cells that are puffy and uh, transitional, uh, very unique to the um, to the uh, uh, renal system. Uh, I don't have a great so obviously they're better pictures than these two, but they <laughs> you should you, you could find them yourself. So stratified columnar, as I said, mostly the uh, main. The one I know is the male urethra. Uh, you can see here, uh, this is the male urethra. Not all parts of the male urethra, but some, some parts have this stratified columnar. Not really uh, useful, but just something that is there. So the last one is stratified cuboidal. Again, not very common or useful to you, but uh, these are just uh, some of the places that you could find them um, and functions, as I said before, Absorption, excretion, and secretion. Okay, that's the end of this mind map. I'll send this mind map to you. Uh, and uh, I'll just come back to here. So as we can answer some of the, your questions. Um, now. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, do I need to put up my hand? No, 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 no just, just go for it. Yeah. Oh, um, so at the beginning of the presentation, you were talking about signing up. Um, sorry, so how do I yes. do that directly? So you, you could just uh, WhatsApp or email us and we will you know, add, or add, add you to our WhatsApp group. And then our website is, because our society is free, you could, and you could access everything through our website for free and we just put up things on our website uh, there. So yeah, the WhatsApp group is, is good because we tend to um, inform our members of our events and things there. Um, how do I WhatsApp you guys? So you could just email us at- uh, Okay, I'll email you. This. Yeah, sorry. Uh, cap, you will be at gmail.com. And this is my number if you want to WhatsApp me. You could also do that if you want to do that. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. And yeah, um, I hope that was useful to you. It was very good. Thank you, um, Amir. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure everyone will enjoy being able to go back to that, and uh, I'll certainly use that for revision. You know, I need revision for that, so. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's it's yeah. I, I think making mind maps uh, is useful just in general. Uh, I made a lot of mind maps in terms one to two, um, but they're very useful. Yeah, yeah. I think another thing is as well as Amir did mention one of the bullet points is it, it might be difficult to start with because you guys are online for a first term, um, but just try and meet up with people and study with them. I know how beneficial it was for Amir and I to be able to meet up with one another and, and study. Just Absolutely. question one another. It doesn't matter. If you don't know, then the other person knows and then you both learn something. So just remember that you'll always know something that someone else doesn't. So don't worry if uh, if you don't know everything because you certainly don't need to know everything. It's not all about that. So. Uh, Bernita, I think you have your hand up. I'm sorry. Um, your presentation was like really, really good. And I was wondering how you organize your different um, histology slides, like all together. Uh, so I was, I, I actually have a great passion for histology. Um, so I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, basically what I did was, uh, as I said, just I'll give you my revision strategy or studying strategy. Yeah. So I um, went over the lectures the day before and really, you know, engage with group work. That was very important for me to engage with group work. 
And also in terms of getting the slides, I just use the slides from the workbook. There are other things you could go and you know find online and and stuff, but um, a good thing to do is just use the workbook and the pictures there. Um, they do bring other pictures in the exam, but um, I mean it's always good to you know be use multiple sources. Uh, but I think by the end of it, it's it starts as being confusing. I think the first few weeks of medical school. But then when you get to week 12, it starts to make sense. I mean, hopefully by the end of the, by the end of it, it would have made sense. But yeah, hope that answers the question. Yeah, it does. Um, so in the exam, they do tell you um, this, like this is like, for example, maybe a thymus cell. Like, did you tell you which cell it is, right? Or you just have to label yes, it? They they do tell you what the tissue of origin is. Um, I think a, you a couple of times, a couple of times they've given us a slide and like they've asked us where it could be, could be taken from. Um, but it's, it's usually been, you know, it's not been something ridiculous like, like the male urethra or anything like that, like something really difficult. It's always been like the skin or something like that. So I, you know, if, if they don't tell you, then it will be something uh, simpler. They won't be looking for some complex thing that you need a degree to answer, so. Okay. And we're sorry for asking so many questions, mm -hmm. but this is like my first year, so I'm a little bit apprehensive. Um, for our first EDT exam, it's going to be open book, and I'm kind of a bit apprehensive because I'm thinking it's going to be way harder since we are able to look at our book. Have you guys had any open book assessment? And can you give me some feedback on that? So yeah, first? just, uh, could you repeat the question? I I, my, I got reconnected, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, so for our first EDT exam for first year of medical school, we're having yeah. an open book assessment. So basically, we can look through, you know, our different um, books while doing the exam. So I'm thinking it's going to be way harder than normal EDT exams since we can basically look through a book. So I was wondering if you guys have done any open book assessment yet and how did you guys find it? So I've, we've never actually done any open book uh, things. Mm -hmm. um, so our ethos have all been closed book sort of formal etos. Um, but even the quizzes, I tend to do them closed book. Um, I don't know. I think I think the uh, ETO one is certainly doable. I'm not sure if they would increase the difficulty, maybe not. But um, if you if you actually spend time and uh, you know revise uh, properly, you know, just uh, not a ridiculous amount of time, but just, you know, a good amount of time each day, you would be able to pass. So don't worry about at one. Um, but yeah, I think uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe while you're revising you could, uh, for yourself, you could just have the most important things that you think would gonna, is going to come up or the thing that they put uh, emphasis on, on a, on a uh, more accessible, uh, paper or whatever, so you could access it easier. We've had um, we've had formatives which they've given out to us or um, mocks, and they haven't necessarily told us that um, it needs to be closed book. So we've had the option, and there's been a couple of times I've chosen to do open book, and I have found that when you push yourself to do closed book, you do a lot better. I think when you when you know that you've got an open book, it's so easy to say, oh, well, I'll just look that up. Um, but it, it's it sounds like rubbish to say it, but you really do spend more time looking up answers than actually, yeah. you know, if, if you've just if you're in an exam and you don't know it and you don't have the option of an open book, you know, you just move on, you're not wasting too much time. So um, it's good that you guys do have an open book because it's your first one. So I think it's a, that is a good thing. Um, but like Amir said, is are you able to have like your own notes or does it have to be like workbooks that you can have open? 
Um, no, because I we were thinking because it's our first EDT exam is online, so they told us open book. We were thinking that's going to be way harder, like some of the questions in the workbook where we actually haven't studied for. So they might give us something we haven't covered before, and they expect to see some of the applications that were taught to us to answer the question. So we were kind of thinking, like my group, were thinking that this exam might be way harder since we do have the options of having our book open. And it might be like, you know, they give us a scenario where we've never, you know, come across before. So I'm just wondering, have they given you guys a questions which you guys haven't actually seen in any of the lecture slides? Or was everything in your exam like covered before? Uh, yeah, I, I I think um, it's it's easy to come out of an exam and say, oh, they never taught us that, and then you go back and look at the the PowerPoint slides, etc., and it's it's always there. Like everything that they put in is always there. Um, sometimes you know they ask, they do ask like the small details, but it'll be worth half a mark or one mark. Um, so you know, really don't get yourself down about trying to remember absolutely everything. Um on the PowerPoint slide, because by the time you come to doing ETA three and, and four or five and six, it's far too much information and it's it's not really feasible to remember it. So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about them making it more difficult. Um, I I highly doubt they would do that, um, especially considering it's your first one. Um, so I think, you know, just just trust the system and just apply yourself right from the start and you'll be you'll be absolutely fine. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with Cameron. I think if you just, you know, just study the, just, just study what you can and uh, trust the system. They're very thorough with uh, how they choose the questions, so it wouldn't be unfair. Um, but yeah, if you just study what you can and sort of uh, revise well, you'll be fine. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Guys, revise. Did you really base it on lectures, or did you like kind of just workbook or a mixture of both? You know, where should we focus all of our energy when picking out the information? You know. So I would say um, for first year, I mostly focused um, on the lectures, but also the workbook. I mean, they they do tend to sometimes bring up things that are only mentioned in the workbook. I've seen. A couple of examples of that. So I would say the lectures mostly, but if you want to get, you know, if you have time, then go through the workbook as well. Not as in detail, but just, you know, go through it. It, it does help, you know, the workbook is, is nice. Uh, the questions in the workbook, very good for revision. Uh, the workbook itself is, is amazing. Uh, for second term, uh, I'm not sure if you have MSK, uh, musculoskeletal. Yeah. You know, if they've changed it, but um, I use the workbook only for that, for my whole revision, because mm -hmm. the lectures were not as good. Um, there's also a thing called less than all, so I don't know if you know about that. I'm more than happy to give it to you. Uh, it's yeah. from the Leicester Medical School. Uh, it, it, oh, I, use, I use that too for metabolism and MGD and uh, not so much for histology, but um, I can also give you that if you're not already in position of it. Hopefully that would be really helpful. Um, and I was just wondering, um, you know, the group work questions and the self-study, self-directed study questions. I noticed I was finding like myself, you know, searching on, on Google. And if I have to go out of my way to search it on Google and I can't find it in my in my notes and lecture slides, is it really necessary for me to go that extra mile to try and memorize that that sort of information? I, I, I don't think necessarily the effort to memorize it and probably not but I think the fact that you've you've actively gone and searched it up and read through the question thought about it and then you couldn't come up with the answer I've certainly found that even going through that process of not knowing but still thinking about it and then you look it up and you find the answer um definitely helps I think um so don't necessarily worry about you know if you fill in all the questions in the workbook for say week four don't necessarily worry about memorizing all the answers. I think if you have it filled in, mm -hmm. whether that's on a paper copy or digital copy, um, if you have them filled in, it's a really good way of revising. Like with friends, if you go through the workbook questions, Amir and I did that for our last exam. Mm -hmm. It's it's such a good way of like being thorough about it. If you go through the lecture together, 
you know, through the slides, the most important things in the slides. And then you say, right, let's go through the, the workbook questions. It's a really good way of covering, you know, this much about, you know, this much about that many topics rather than, you know, one thing really, really in depth. So I think it's, it's yeah. a, you, you'll, you will, you'll definitely learn at the, um, Kenny Langlands that used to, that used to teach with us used to say, it's about learning how to learn. And it was so cliche because he used to say it all the time, but it's really true. Like you do develop your own style of studying and then you'll orientate yourself around people that also do the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, don't be too stressed about, you know, getting it nailed first time around because it definitely took, I certainly know for myself and probably Amir as well, it took up until probably at least the third term to really feel like you knew what you were doing with it. Mm -hmm. um. Can I, can I just add that um, I think in the first two terms, um, especially the first term, you would you tend to Google stuff a lot more than say third term. And the, and the, as you go through the terms, the the questions become more relevant, and you you're you're able to answer them more. So it's just the fact that they don't want you to just have the answers; they want you to search for the answers. But I mean, you know, for the first terms, uh, first two terms, it's not really useful sometimes but as you go through the terms it does become very useful they, be they become very relevant and uh, the workbook questions are actually really nice um but i think for even for the first term as you go through the weeks they become more relevant as you go through it and uh, for for instance the uh, the questions for metabolism week nine are amazing i highly suggest you do them also for, for tob i think very good questions but don't try to memorize them mm -hmm. no. it's more the process is what you're saying absolutely yeah. yeah definitely thank you no problem uh bernita thank you um yeah so just in regards to what um alba said um between what to learn and what not to learn i'm finding it very difficult to know exactly what needs to be in my head and which one I just need to understand. Can you please just um, explain to us how we figure that out? Uh, so I think um, they, as Cameron said, sometimes they do bring some random detail on, on lecture slides or the, the workbook. But if you grasp the main learning objectives, then there you go, you know. If you gain the, you know, grasp the main uh, stuff that is being taught in that session, then you're good. And if you if you learn details, then that's good for you. But if you just learn the gist of it, I think you're fine. Um, but I think going through, the, this is what I do still, I go through the lecture slides and I just learn the whole thing on, on you know, uh, or I try to learn it actually, uh, but that's how I do it. And I think it's difficult to, to know what exactly you should know because it's it's a lot of uh, content and it becomes more difficult when you go through like six terms and you have to study for ETA six, then you have six terms of things to learn about and memorize and do. And, 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 and there's always something new I've, I've noticed. Like when you go through in ETA six, I went back to uh, term one and there was like things that I never have seen before in the lectures so I just said maybe like if you go through the lecture and just try to learn the, the basics uh, on, on each slide then you're, you're fine uh, Hannah if you have any anything hi yeah I feel like like sometimes the lectures they're really really heavy content all in one go and then so I go to I feel like I'm not I'm doing something wrong. So I learn I go to learn the lecture and then I go to learn the workbook and then I want to make cue cards or something. And then it, I feel like I'm doing something that is too time consuming. I don't know. Is am I doing the right thing <laughs> by doing all of that? I think um, I, I think it's like I said before and like Amir said, it's like you learn your own way of doing things. And I think um, trying to do everything is like you said very time consuming and you also do need you know you need that time to yourself in the evening to chill watch a film or something you know you need to do something other than medicine at the same time um so i think if you you know 
if you are reading over the lecture before you go to it or through the through the workbook or whatever before you go to it um then you do the lecture the lecture is the second time you're hearing these things so that's always helpful and then if you do something you know if you read to the workbook or made cue cards based on the slides then that's the third time you've gone through it and you know you're only halfway through the day so i think you know just go at a pace which you feel comfortable with but you also you know you're not putting things off to another day saying ah like it's very easy especially when things are online and they're recorded to say oh i'll listen to them on saturday because i can guarantee you two saturdays down the line you won't listen to them on a saturday um because you need all the time off you can so just you really just use your time well um and you know however many weeks you are into term one don't be spending 15 hours a day trying to make uh, notes or whatever on 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 a lecture i just sometimes sorry i feel like it's it's just one lecture can have so much like in a levels they'll break up into like a topic over three days but then when i go to listen to the lectures i, I feel like it could be like a week's worth of content crammed into like one lecture i just feels like there's so many processes in one go i don't know it's how, how do you like cope with like keeping your attention for that long when you're listening to that <laughs> So I think um, obviously when it's online, it's very difficult. Um, term six for us, which was the our most recent term, you know, it was really difficult to focus on the lectures and actually keep going. But I think, uh, you know, if you just um, keep yourself engaged and as Cameron said, don't tire yourself too much. Um, you also need your life. But um, what I what I tend to do um is um to to engage and also revise is to um read the lecture slides or the workbook the day before and also listen to the lecture while i make you know lecture notes which are just you know small notes um uh, besides the, the the actual slides um and that's it mostly for that day. and then obviously the group work the group work is is very good uh, to you know, talk to people, which is not very tiring as, you know, as much tiring as listening to a lecture, which is a bit boring. But um, I think the the, work, the the group works are good uh, to just make sure you have a good understanding of the things that are being taught. That's, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK. Anything else? Um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you will, will feel the same way um, as Hannah does, um, but don't worry about it because um, it'll just make things worse. So just try to um, really just try to enjoy it. I think Amir and I have certainly found the more that you like get involved with it and the more you just just enjoy yourself. It sounds really stupid because it's, it's it's a really difficult um, course to get through. But if you do if you do just enjoy it, you know, um and you'll find that the burden is lifted or is certainly lightened um compared to you know thinking oh i've got this much to do today rather than just you know thinking i'm looking forward to what i'm going to learn today um just try and keep that going um, it's difficult to keep it going but um just try and remember the end goal as well i think when you're um when you're in the the difficult days and you're struggling to find motivation or whatever just remember the end goal that four and a half years down the line that you'll be graduated as a doctor you know and just keep that as motivation to apply yourself i think it sounds cliche and stupid but i think as some like as two people that are halfway through or just over halfway um that's definitely the thing that keeps you going in the end i think absolutely thank you kevin okay if there's nothing else then uh oh Bernita, please Go ahead. I'm so sorry for keeping you no, guys no, here. No, no problem at all. Um, just in regards to, um, um, just in addition to Hannah's question on staying on top of, you know, classes and paying attention, um, I find it hard because although I do look at the lecture slides beforehand, I, mm -hmm. I do find it hard to listen to the lecture and also view the lecture slides. How do you, because I, find that I never really listen to the lecture. I'm only just reading the slides 
and understanding it. So how do you balance both of those things? Um, I think what I do is uh, I don't I don't tend to read the lecture slides. <laughs> I just write what the lecturer is saying um, on the right hand side or whatever on the, next to the lecture slides, which is not the best thing actually. But that that's just what I do, and I that's how I listen to the lecture. I mean, I think it's different for everyone, but um, um, yeah, I think f for me it's uh, the fact that you're coming to a lecture is to listen to the lecture, not to read the lecture, because the lecture signs are always there. You could just, you know, uh, um, go back to them whenever you want, but the lecture is, you know, there. So you could just put anything uh, in addition to what the lecture slides have next to the lecture slides. That's what I do. So anything additional that uh, would uh, result in uh, me understanding more, then I would do that. So um, I will. I think we'll, we can end this now. I'll just stop. Stop recording.